Okay, we have a question already. Hang on. Okay, so we've got this equation. Now you need to know the formula. Okay, you should, by using the formula a dozen times, you should start to remember. Okay, uh, and you have to know how to identify A, B, and C, but after you've done a dozen of these, you know how to identify those. Okay, A is the number in front of X squared, in this case, that would be three. B is whatever's in front of X, that's a four. And C is the number, what ain't got no X. <laughs> okay, the number is just a bare enough. Uh, and of course, your equation can't be put in this form. It's not a quadratic equation, and this doesn't apply. Okay, so quadratic equation has to sit is something that can be put into this form. This one is already in this form, but we saw last time examples of equations you had to rearrange and put into this form. So we can review that video. Um, now we'll, we'll probably be seeing additional examples. Um, so in this case, well, I, I say just to reinforce everything, I'd like you to write out A equals three, B equals four, C equals eight. You know, first, that's a problem you do write it out like this because that locks it in for you much better than just doing it visually and forgetting what you did until you do it the next time. Okay. So we're going to get x equals, well, it's very simple. The substitution didn't give anybody any problems. But we're substituting three for a, which occurs here and here. We're substituting four for b, which occurs here and here. We were substituting three for c, which occurs just. And you get used to that. You do it several times and, and, and you've got it. Okay, so that's going to be then the square root of four squared minus four times three times eight. And that's all over two times three. That's negative four plus or minus square root of, so well, that's going to be 16 and that's going to be negative by six. So that's going to give you negative eight. Two times three is six. So just identify A, B, and C, know the formula, put the numbers in, and do the arithmetic. Okay, well, now what do you do with the arithmetic here? We've got a couple of options. Um, I could separate this out. I could say negative four over six plus or minus the square root of negative 80 over six. Okay, but right now I'm going to concentrate on that 80 because I can distribute this division anytime I want to. So I'm gonna hold off on that. Uh, that's just a matter of taste. You can do that any way you want to. Uh, okay, so first we do a prime factorization of 80. Well, I'll do that over here because very quickly. You got 80, which equals two times 40. You bring down the two, the 40 is two times 20. Bring down these twos. Oh, that's not two. That's and you get two times 10. And you bring down these twos. That's going to be two times five. So 80, you got four twos and a five, right? That's two to the four. Times five. Now you know you can do the square root of two to the fourth. That's just two squared. Okay. Now if you don't see why that's two squared, remember what we did last week. It's, you've got four twos there in a row. You break that into a pair of twos and a pair of twos. So it's a pair of twos squared, which is going to give you a pair of twos. Now, work that out as you will. You need to review. Review, but we need to we need to move on. So I don't want to uh, take a lot of time to redo that. Okay, so make sure you've got that locked in. Okay, and so this is going to be negative four plus or minus. I'm going to write it this way.
I can factor this into two to the fourth times five times negative one. Because two to the fourth is a real number, just two squared is four. Five is square root of five is a real number, okay? Square root of negative one ain't real. There's nothing you can square to get a negative because you multiply two negatives, you get a positive. You multiply two positives, of course, you get a positive. There's no real number you can multiply itself to get a negative anything. Okay, so we have so, so far x equals negative four. Well, the square root of two, four, two, two to the fourth is two squared. In a minute, I'll write that out as four. And we know it's four uh, times the square root of five times i. What's i? Well, we did this last time. Let's reiterate it. I is the square root of negative one. I'll put a little red circle. I think whatever that is. Okay. Around the eye. Okay, so that's negative four. Plus or minus four square root of five. I over six. All right. Now one mistake I saw. Put some of the homework. Uh, there's a tendency to be a little careless to keep that I under the radical. Okay. If you factor it out like this, you'll see that I is totally separate. It's not under any radical. I is the square root of negative one. So if you have a square root of negative one, that's I. Okay. So if that's the process when you have a negative under the radical. Now, if you have a positive under the radical, well, you don't have to worry about I. You get a real number. Okay. Now, what does this have to do with graphs of parabolas? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? Well, we haven't even talked about graphs. <laughs> okay, so it's not obvious, but we're going to get into this. It's the next thing we're going to do. So I'm going to give you a little prelude, prep up, 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 preview. Okay. This point here has x coordinate negative b over 2a. And where's negative b over 2a? It's right here. And that would be your negative four over six, okay, in this case. Now, this wouldn't be the graph of this because negative b over two a is negative, b over here in the negative x axis. Now, you might not be all that familiar with graphing an x and y axis, but if you have a little familiarity, I'm just telling you right now, there's a strong connection between this and this, okay? Also, The numbers that you get here are the x coordinates where this thing passes through the origin. I mean, passes through the x axis. Okay. These aren't real numbers, meaning that this graph is either above or below the x axis. Now, you don't have to remember any of that. But just kind of notice it for the moment so that one of the things, if we can build up this picture of graphs, then that's going to be a Big help to you when you get into pre calculus. Okay. Okay. Anyhow, there we have our two solutions. So, so then we can say this is negative two thirds. Plus or minus four square root of five i. That's our. Yeah, okay. This means X 
X could be yes, or X could be. This. So the plus or minus means you can choose the plus or you can choose the minus. They're different, but each one is a solution for the equation. Now, if you know complex number arithmetic, you can plug this back in and get your result. And of course, we have an assignment on complex numbers, which isn't particularly difficult, but we will talk about it some. Uh, People did well on it. Okay, everything but dividing complex numbers. And you know, I'm not going to mess with dividing complex numbers. Prioritizing what you're going to need is what we've accomplished so far and what we need to accomplish. What are we done to there? Um, probably not going to worry about division of complex numbers right now. You pick that up when you need it. And you'll need it pre calculus, but it'll be introduced there too. Okay. Ideally, you would know it now, so it isn't a stumbling block, but it's not hard. You'll be okay with it, as long as you remember the distributive law. And if you're going to live through pre-calculus, you cannot forget the distributive law. <laughs> okay. Okay, so hopefully I've answered a few of your questions in the context of this, but I'm going to see if there are any questions left. Okay, just to double up on a little clarification, this is where I comes from. You can factor out a square root of negative one. And once you get that square root of negative one, that takes care of your negative here. Okay? So that's not part of what you're taking the square root of here. So since it factors out, it's going to be separate from the square root. It would not be under the radical sign. Once you've said, well, square root of negative one is I, okay, that's it. You get an I. Doesn't need to be under here. That would be, that would put the I itself under a radical. It was a square root of, it was negative one that was under the radical, not I. So one way or another, I comes out separate. Does not go under the radical. So it's real easy when you're writing it out to just kind of extend this little bar too far and get the I under there. You need to understand that that's how one goes. That's bottom line. Okay. Uh, so that's good. I think people are okay with the prime factorization. The reason we do the prime factorization is we get to use what we learned last week about square roots and radicals of powers. Comes out this way. Another way to see this is well, if you know that 16 divides 80, you can say, well, that's a square root of 16 times square root of 5. You know, 16 times 5 is 80. It doesn't take long before you get into a real mess with numbers that you can't see. And a lot of people can't see that 16 times 5 is 80. People don't do that much mental arithmetic. Some of you are pretty good at mental arithmetic. You're going to see that some of you are probably not going to see it at least if the numbers get a little bigger than this let me do one more thing i'll answer your question in a second uh one of the questions i have involved square root of thousand eight what do you do about the square root of thousand eight well you do a prime factorization you keep dividing by the smallest possible number Okay, so there are three ways we can divide by two. We get down 135 if I'm doing this right. Okay. And then, well, we can divide this by three. We get three times 45. It was three times 15. And if I haven't made a mistake, here's what you have. Okay. Meaning, remember, 
that when you do this, every row multiplies out to original number, which is why I keep bringing these things down. So this multiplies out the original number. This is two cubed times three cubed times five. Okay. So that's the square root of 1080 is the square root of two cubed times three cubed times five, which is then square root of two squared times three squared times the square root of Two times three times five. Okay. And that's the way somebody told me it works out 144, seven, seven or something else. Um, it doesn't seem like we do unless I made a mistake. Since I never make a mistake, it didn't happen. Okay. Uh, yeah, right. Okay. This would then come out just two times three. This would be the square root of thirty. Okay. Now let's make sure that things multiply out. That's eight, that's twenty-four. Eight times twenty-four is 192. 192 times five is not a thousand eighty because two hundred times five is a thousand. So I did something wrong. How could I possibly have done anything wrong? Well, let's say I divide that by three. Boy, that's not bad. Yeah. These are pretty easy calculations. One hundred thirty-five three times forty-five. Forty-five is three times fifteen. I really don't see it. I really don't see a problem. Please don't multiply out. Okay. Again, that's eight. Oh, that's not 24. That's 27. I have the eight in my head. I saw the three and I got 24 without processing it with whatever's left in my brain. Okay. So that's 27. Uh, and uh, that works out. Okay. So well, this is six times the square root of 30. Now there's more that you can do with these numbers and I'm not gonna be all that picky at this stage. I want you to see at least as much as somebody who had sat through an algebra course and made a, at least a strong sense, <laughs> okay? So you have the skills to go into the pre-calculus with the support course. Because most people really need that support course. Uh, going to pre-calculus with what you're learning here. It's iffy. Whether you can get out of it with decent grade, retaining your sanity. Okay. So anyhow, there we are. Now we had a question, so. Okay, I've got a lot of good questions. That's exactly what we need. I had another question, uh, and we don't need to address this because I address the same thing over here. Um, so I'll just have that submission. I don't mind things being missing. It's a bit harder to read. You can tell by looking around the lab. I don't have a problem with messing. <laughs> okay. And I hope you don't. Uh, okay. Uh, so we have a question. Well, what if you have x squared minus 12 equals zero? Okay. Well, that's a quadratic function. It turns out that this is easy to solve. You don't even need the quadratic formula, but still you want to you want to see how it would be used. Well, this is ax squared with bx plus c. A is what's in front of x squared. Let's just put a number in front of this one. I have or about the understood one. I think everyone understands that. Anyway. Excuse me. Okay. What's in front of x squared? Well, there's a four. There's nothing in front of the x squared. Well, it's automatically a one, right? Everybody understands that. Uh, 
What's B? What's in front of X? No, nothing in front of X. And no X. There's a zero in front of X. So we didn't have to write it down. Okay? So B is zero. And C is negative 12. Okay? So X turns out to be, if you follow the whole quadratic form, well, B is going to be zero, so you don't even have to write it down. I'll write it down. Zero plus or minus the square root of zero squared minus four times four times negative 12. All that over two times four. Well, that's going to be. You could multiply this out. 16 times 12 is 192. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so you'd have a square root of 192 here. I'll write it down. If you do prime factorizations, these you do the prime factorization here. You got a two squared and a two squared. You know, two squared times three. So that gives you two to the sixth times three over eight. And you go on and you get two to the third, which is eight over eight. Okay. Yeah, it's right now. And you get plus or minus the square root of three. Okay. Well, all of the straightforward stuff, you can understand them. You don't have to, you don't have to uh, necessarily think through every step right now, but understand that if you plug into the quadratic formula, you get this. However, look at this equation. Here's how we solve it. Add 12 with both sides, we get this. Divide both sides by four, we get three. So X is plus or minus a third of three in four easy steps. We didn't have to do this. Okay. Now why is the solution X squared equals three plus or minus a square root of three? But what do you get when you square square root of three? You get three. What do you get when you square the negative square root of three? You get negative square root of three times negative square root of three, which is positive square root of three times square root of three, which is three. Okay? So either plus or minus the square root of three, so the square root gives you three, so that's why the solution is this. Which is easier, this or this? They're both reliable if you do them accurately. Okay, you're more likely to make a mistake doing this, but so be it. If you decide to use a quadratic formula, it works. No big deal. Just a little extra work and a little extra opportunity to trip up. Okay, it's important to understand this. <coughs> And yeah, we're, we're going to see why. Okay. Well, that's what we really need to know about the quadratic formula. Hopefully, that clears up a lot of questions. And if you have more questions, uh, you got another one right now, ask it. And if more questions come up. Okay, question was where do we get the two times three here out of this? Well, there's an intermediate step we could write out, okay? Uh, two squared times three squared, well, the square root of two squared times three, what? Okay, two squared times three squared is two times three squared, right? Just your little square exponents. And comes down to common sense as well. 
but um, it, it's a little. So the square root of two squared times three squared is, is the square root of two times three squared. Okay. What's the square root of something squared? It's the something. Square root of this squared is this. Now we could have also written that out. Uh, you know, two squared is four, three squared is nine, four times nine is 36. This is the square root of 36. Well, you recognize the square root of 36 as being six. So you could have done that. In general, you wouldn't be able to do that. If these numbers are, are big, you could end up with a product like um, 256, okay? You probably don't know if you have done a fair amount of mental arithmetic, but the square root of 256 is 16, okay? Or maybe you get 1,024, okay? You know, the square root of 1,024 is 32, you know? Okay. Now, if you know the powers of two, you can figure that out, but you don't have to know that. It's not bad to know it. But the point is, you get, if you multiply these out before you do the square root, you might not recognize that you have a perfect square. If you keep it in factored form and do with the numbers, it's the same thing you would do with the symbols. It works out. So you want you want to work on that and you want to try to realize that. Okay. Things in the back again. Yeah. Uh, Okay. You divide that by five. Okay. You get 55. Then you have another five. You got 11. Over six. You agree? Did you try and pack for that? 275 comes down to five times five times 11. Okay. Well, that's just five squared. I'm going to write it down. Okay. I'm going to write it this way. Take care of that negative by putting the negative one there. I got five from the square root of five squared. I've got 11 square root of 11 from the square root of 11 doesn't change. The square root of negative one, the right of five. And then we have two solutions, one corresponding to the plus, one corresponding to the minus. Okay. So you need to process this and you need to you know, do, the, do the problems if necessary, check the video from last time, but it's just more of this, but a we'll, couple, couple examples. Okay, the camera is out of focus when I first wrote this down, we managed to get focus. And hopefully it won't zoom back again. Uh, okay. Negative two. X squared. Well, that would be negative two squared, right? So we write that down. And I'm going to write that down for every number. Okay. So that's where we start. 
write out literally what we do with this number to get x squared. Okay, for well, what's negative two squared? Well, let's write out what negative two squared is. It's negative two times negative two, isn't it? What do you get when you multiply negative two by negative two? Show me the figure. You get four. You get two negatives, you get a positive. Now, a common error I see people make is they'll write negative four. Okay. If you write it out like this, I don't think you're going to write a negative four there. Okay. In other words, write out the details. Take the time to do the details as the arithmetic. Otherwise, you end up not understanding this very fundamental table. Okay. And then yeah, we're on a little shorter time, so let me do this quickly, but make sure you understand. You want to more, you want to write out these steps. Otherwise, you're going to be very prone, as are most people. Get it wrong and so on. Okay. Question. Okay, so that's negative one half times negative one half. Now, what you don't do, and thanks for somebody for asking, as I was about to say it, took the words right out of my mouth. We're doing fractions, we're not doing decimals. Decimals is what you get if you rely on your calculator. We don't rely on a calculator. None of these calculations require a calculator. They're all very simple. You do it by the rules. Okay. Now, there are expressions of where you would really want to use a calculator, especially to involve divisions or multiplications by large numbers of weird powers. Okay. But we're not getting that here. But these are all simplest possible calculations. Okay. Now, how do you multiply two fractions? You multiply the numerators and you multiply the denominators, right? So that equals plus because you got two minuses. So it's one times one over two times two and it's positive. So it's one fourth and it's positive. Now I've still got pre-calculus students who are making mistakes on even this table. And they're really good students, they're doing well, but they're still making arithmetic mistakes in these tables, which is misleading them. And I think I've managed to beat it out of most of them, <laughs> okay? And they're very cooperative, they're hard work and they're a great group, okay? Uh, so, uh, but even they, and, and they generally got a fairly decent background, but they can't do the arithmetic. Okay, you got to come back to the original. Thing. Well, no surprise that zero squared is zero, but write it out. It means zero times zero, and that's zero. Make it so obvious that you can't make a mistake. Okay, now this is then one half times one half, which is one times one over two times two, which is one fourth. This is one times one, which is one. And this is two times two, which is two. So when we do these tables, and there are actually five of them, okay? When we do these tables, we write out every detail of the arithmetic so that number one, we re um, reinforce, I got the word refresh in my mind, we couldn't get reinforced out of it there for a minute. Uh, but we reinforce the details of why these numbers are what they are, and it's very important to understand that because this is one of the big foundations of pre calculus. Right? Okay, now I'm gonna write. Y equals x squared. And I'm going to sketch a set of coordinate axes. 
You seen these before? Yeah, basic familiarity. Okay. I mean, not everybody. You know, I, I think I think they're introducing elementary school. So. Okay. Uh, but you probably haven't done much with them at the level of algebra two. Okay. So that's why we want to talk about it here. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put two here. And an equal distance on the other side of the x axis, I'm going to put negative t. Okay. Then I'm going to put four up here. Now, the reason is. This is the x axis and this is the y axis. So the x numbers go in this scale. Okay. And the x numbers all go between negative two and two. The y numbers are all between zero and four. So right there's a y equals zero, obviously. And right there's a y equals four. Okay. Having done that, I can get an accurate scale so that the graph has approximately the right shape, reasonably good shape. If I got these at equal distances and a little off, but not too bad. Okay. Now, if I divide the interval here in half and divide this interval in half, then what number goes here? Show me with your fingers. Yeah, one. Okay, here's two, no, sorry, that's one half, okay? Divide four. There's one. Okay. Half of two is one. So halfway between zero and two is one. And here's one half. I see too many graphs where the distance from zero to one half and the things the distance from zero to one, which is okay, is that's right. But then distance from one to two is the same as these. No, distance from one to two has to be twice as big as this, right? Distance from one to two is one, it has to be this big. If you divide these intervals in half, you're going to get that. <clears throat> it's going to be pretty accurate. More accurate than it would be if you just mark them off, you know, you start here and you mark them off this way. So I recommend. you actually do this. Okay. Then oh boy, that's that's way too long. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's a little hard to do this when I'm looking down on it. Probably some kind of genetic defect. Okay. Anyhow, there's two then I divide this interval in half, I'm going to get three. I divide this interval in half, it gives me one. Then I really don't have room to label it, but I divide this in half, which gives me one half. And then I divide the interval from zero to one half in half, it gives me one fourth. Okay, now I've got all the numbers on these columns. So all the numbers here are represented down here. All the numbers here are represented by, well, four, two, one, one half. Well, we don't have one half, but we did one half, so we get one fourth. Okay. So we've got our one fourth there. We've got our one here. We've got our four here. Then we construct a table. When x is negative two, y is four. So x is negative two for every point above and below this point on the axis, and y is equal to four for every point over here. So right here is the point that we call two, four. X is two, y is four. Well, we continue that. We've got the point negative, and it's negative two, four, not two. We've got negative one, X is negative one, Y is one. Well, X is negative one, Y is one. That gives me a point here. 
If x equals negative one half, y is one fourth. There's one fourth, there's one half, there's a point. We have the point zero, zero. And I'm gonna, and we're out of time, so I'm not gonna belabor this. I wanna show you this. Okay, so we've got these points. I guess we are sure that we're seeing the points. I'll call it and slow. Okay. Then I'm going to join them with a smooth curve. Smooth curve comes down here and it has to level off and comes back up through here. Not through this point. Okay. Now, if I did a graph of this function, it would have exactly the same shape as a graph of this function. It would just be in a different place. And it might be a little skinnier or a little fatter, but it's still going to have this basic shape. Imagine stretching it out against skinnier or squeezing it. Or the y axis, it would still have the same shape, but in kind of a different scale. Okay, if you were to graph this, I can tell you. And one of my goals there in the last part of the course is going to be convince you that this is true, okay, and show you how to get it. See that negative five over six? So where's negative five, six? Well, if this is a uh, Negative two, negative one, negative five, six is about here. Okay. So I know that the vertex, the low point of this graph, has to be on this line somewhere. That means the curve may be up here, maybe down here. Okay. I also know that I don't have real number solutions so that this thing can't ever be zero. That means I plug in any value of x, I'm not going to get zero, meaning the graph will never touch the x-axis. You have to digest that a little bit, and we're not going to digest it. You know, the very short time we have here. If I plug negative five, six in here, I get something close to 30, so it's pretty close to 30. So this is 30 on my y-axis. That can't be. Oh, yeah, it's negative five. So, okay, it's a little less than 30, but I'm going to put 30 there. 25 will be here. If x is zero, I get 25. So, I know I've got this point in the graph. So, my parabola is going to end up looking something like this. Now, you don't have to understand that process. The only reason I did that and told you a little bit about where the numbers are coming from is that understanding how this turns into this, pretty big deal in free calculus. And I'm not going to show you the details, but this is why we start with this graph. We have to first understand this graph, then understand how this graph moves to give us this graph and how it changes shape a little bit actually gets stretched out. So this ends up being skinnier than this one, even though it doesn't look that way because my scale here is different from my scale. Uh, okay, there's an introduction. The bottom line is I give you a function. You need to be able to make this table. Okay. And we're way over time. The other functions are 
y equals x cubed, y equals one over x. So those are three of the most important functions. And the reason they're important is because we build almost all of pre-calculus, calculus and beyond on a few basic functions. And you're gonna have an assignment on the basic functions. Do you understand how to do the table in the graph? And ignore the fact that these fools do things in decimals because they seem to think it's not important to understand the arithmetic. No, because that's convenient because they use technology more than I think should be. But they know as much as I do, or at least they think they do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm not being generous. I know way more than they do. Uh, a bunch of smart people, okay? But I think they're misguided in using too much cash. We do it with flash. Okay. Uh, and that's going to be an assignment. That's your basic functions assignment. Okay. So we started here with that people. We're at the moment of inertia of a beam. Mass 200 grams, we see that. Okay, with 50 gram magnets on the ends, let's say they're 30 centimeters, they're actually centered a little closer than that. Close enough. And a hoop of radius 200 grams, uh, of mass 200 grams, radius 10 centimeters. That's this. Okay, that's not really a hoop because it's got some significant thickness. We could get the moment of inertia by doing one half m r squared for the whole radius. It's subtracting the one half m r squared for the part that isn't it. Okay, but it's not really, okay. Uh, we'd have to calculate the mass of what's in here by using the mass density of what's out here. Okay, so that'd be, not difficult, but you have to think about it a little bit. Okay, the point is, we're just going to approximate this as a hoop. And its radius is actually 10 and a half centimeters. The kind of an average radius is close, pretty close to 10 centimeters. So we're just going to use that as a ballpark. And what we're thinking about is what happens when the beam is rotating like this, and I drop this on the beam and manage to get it centered well enough that it stays there instead of falling off, okay? It took a few tries, but it wasn't that difficult. If I can do it in a few tries, any idiot can do it in their first try. Okay, so. We calculate the moments of inertia, very simple. Then over moment of inertia calculations. All these that involves you one half I and MR squared. Uh, that's just MR squared for each magnet. Uh, and I hoop is just MR squared for the hoop because all the mass is at least to the extent that this thing can be modeled by a hoop is at the rim since all the distance on it. Okay, and we've talked about all that, so I'm not going to talk about it again. We want to take this information and figure out what happens when I drop the hoop onto the beam. But what happens is the beam exerts a torque on the hoop and the hoop exerts a torque on the beam. You have equal and opposite torques. And I've got an irritating pop-up on the screen. Okay. Uh, so what I ask is, does anybody know how to get the angular momentum? of the beam and magnets if they're moving at 1.5 radians per second. Okay, well, haven't seen that yet. It's in the upcoming assignment. Wanted to make sure nobody had seen it. So I talk about it, okay? Uh, your hypothesis here is well,
That torque is moment of inertia times your angular acceleration. It comes out very straightforward. It's totally analogous to Newton's second law. There are various ways of deriving. Okay. Now, I'm going to move through this fairly fast because I want to start talking about gravitation. Let me just comment. There's a third assignment in Chapter 10. It's not there anymore. I just haven't taken it away. So if you've started that, I'll give you some credit for starting it. But we can do without it, okay? Because we just launched a moon rocket a few hours ago, the first time in 50 years, okay? Uh, a rocket cable carrying people to the moon. And it was a pretty neat launch. And I can talk about rocket launches. Just a side comment before we get back to this. I counted. The thing's about 300, it's about, it's about 10 meters, 100 meters tall. I think it's 330 feet or something like that. It's a little over 10 meters, okay? A little over 100 meters, 10 meters. Okay, you fall from 10 meters and live. If you land right and don't have physical problems. Okay. Uh, it's if you can die, you can live at 10 meters. Don't do it. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, four meters is about the limit of what you can do reliably without injury. Uh, 10 meters, you've got two and a half times the kinetic energy. And, uh, uh, you know, you're going to have six times the impact to the impulse momentum. Okay, we can work that out. Uh, 300 feet, 100 meters, unless you land on something soft, uh, you most likely gonna fracture your thoracic spine. Okay, your head's next. Uh, if you're lucky and land on your back, you just flat. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, but it's, all, it's impossible to live at a fall from that height unless you mitigate it. That's why you fall into a fruit tree or something. Uh, okay, so that's hot. Gets up there in six seconds. Okay. Which is comparable to the time it takes to fall that far. You work that out, you know how to work that out. Acceleration is what? Well, in six seconds, you get up to, well, your average velocity is going to be 100 meters over six seconds, about 16 meters per second. Okay. Final velocity about 32 meters per second. Okay. Per second. You divide that by six, you get a little over five meters per second squared. That thing's accelerating faster than, about as fast as a, 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 a Rick's car. Okay. It doesn't look like it's moving very fast. By the time it gets up to the top of that gentry, uh, 30 meters per second is about 70 miles an hour. So six seconds up to 70 miles an hour, you go to zero to 70. You know, a powerful car can do that. Uh, but it just keeps going. A powerful car runs out of power. It's not going to do that in the next six seconds. It's not going to go up another 60 miles an hour in the next six seconds because of power limitations. If it's a, got a rocket engine on it, yeah. But uh, it can actually increase its acceleration as it burns fuel because the mass keeps decreasing. And that's what happens to the rocket. But in the first minute or so, the mass doesn't decrease that significantly. So it accelerates at five meters per second squared, and that keeps increasing slowly. Uh, it's pretty neat to just think about the physics of what's going on there. Then when the first stage separates, it gets some real acceleration. That's what if you're an astronaut, you get jerked way back in your seat, okay? Your launch shakes you to death. Uh, it's, it's very violent. That, that's what people who launch launched say. Uh, but it's safe violence, just shaking them off, making a lot of noise. Uh, you get the main acceleration, when you separate. Uh, and that's where you get several G's. Early Mercury asked much, you get like 10 G's acceleration of close to 100 meters per second squared. That might be exaggerated. It might be 
confusing that with the 10 seconds it takes to lose consciousness. Uh, so I, I, I don't have those numbers in my head. Okay. Uh, so we're going to do a little analysis of what it takes to get that thing to the moon using the universal law of gravitation that we've already looked at. But you haven't really been assigned anything. So you probably don't remember that one. Okay. Net torque, motor inertia, times angular acceleration. You have this. Solve this for alpha, plug it in here. And you get this just like when you do F naught equals MA, A equals F over M. Plug it into VF equals V naught plus A2. Pops out. There it is. Okay. And you can do it with integrals too. All right. So if it was force and velocity or, or, or mass and velocity, you'd have momentum. It's moment of inertia and angular velocity, which has different units. It turns out that the units are kilogram meters squared times radians per second, which is kilogram meters squared per second squared. Okay. It's the same units as joules, but it's not joules. Can I say that right? I think so. Kilogram meters squared. No, I'm sorry, it's kilogram meters per second. Okay. You don't get joules. Multiply it then by displacement and you get joules. Uh, Units of torque are the same as units of joules. Um, because force times moment hour, moment hour is measured in units of distance, force is measured in units of like kilogram meters per second. So multiply it by meters, you get the same unit you get for joules. So you don't want to confuse it. Uh, okay, so back to this situation. Here's why this is angular momentum. We can easily calculate the angular momentum. Often we use the letter L. And that's going to be this and this out of the Get 0.023 kilogram meters squared per second. It's 0.0225. Let's round it up to 0.023 because nothing's quite exact anyway. Since the negatives are actually closer to the center, we can probably just round it down to 0.02. Okay. So we'll go with this calculation. Uh, okay. Now, I'll say as symmetrically as possible, meaning that the center of the hoop is at the axis of rotation. It wasn't quite, you could see it looking like it was wobbling a little bit. Well, I'm just not that good. Okay. But it was, it was fairly close. After dropping the hoop on the beam and what we hope is a more or less symmetric fashion. Uh,
works are evil and all the time. So it's the angular momentum. The change in angular momentum of one is equal to the change, equal and opposite to the change in angular momentum of the other because the torques are equal and opposite and the delta theta is the same for both. Okay. So the change in I omega of one is equal and opposite to the change in I omega of the other. Okay. Work it out then. What's the angular, how much change is there in the angular velocity? And of course, to find out how much change there is in the angular velocity, you probably want to just use the fact that the angular momentum is the same after as it is before and calculate the angular, angular velocity afterwards. Fairly simple. Just use conservation of angular momentum. See if you can do it. I'll give you a couple of minutes. Okay, to be sure that everybody's on track. Because of all this, this argument, which we need to understand, but we can extract the essential conclusion from the argument and use it to answer the question. Angular momentum's unchanged. Okay, so you could say, Angular momentum after she equals angular momentum before. Okay. We have already a numerical quantity for this, but let's do it in symbols. Okay. This means so what's your expression for angular momentum after? What's your expression for angular momentum before? Go ahead and write it out in symbols. Some of you are writing it out in symbols. Some of you just did the numbers. Uh, and of course, just doing the numbers is okay, but Remember that we're trying to emphasize, let's write things out in symbols to reinforce the relationships. Okay. Uh, now it's always a little hard to decide what subscripts to use, you know, how to how to make up the symbols that are going to represent everything, but you'll be all done. Okay. The most straightforward is. I after times omega after equals I before times times omega before. Now that doesn't contain all the symbols. You could write I before as I beam I mag plus I magnets and after as I beam plus I magnets plus I hoot. Okay. You can do that at the very beginning, or you can do it here in a minute before when you write out the Solution. So since we're after omega after, after omega after, yeah, we want to find omega after, and we know omega before because that was given. We can write it out as a simple ratio of the angular velocity, uh, angular moment of the moments of inertia. I'll get it out eventually. Ratio of the moments of inertia times omega four. And there's insight in that. It's just the ratio of your moments of inertia and the omega is going to be inversely proportional to your ratio of moments of inertia. Okay. In other words, the more amount of inertia you end up with, the less angular velocity you're going to end up with. That's obvious in this equation, right? If I after is bigger than I before, then omega after is going to be less than omega before. That's obvious, and it's an inverse proportionality. Uh, again, I'll put a, in a plug for understanding basic proportionality. Uh, inverse correct, inverse square correct. Square and so forth. Uh, okay. 
So, from this, it's pretty straightforward. I have a four is I beam plus I magnets. Can't read that before, neither can I, but you know what that means. Okay, divided by. I B plus I B plus I who, just to make it explicit. And now you've got an expression that has a number for every quantity. You've got a number for I B, a number for I B, a number for I who, and a number for omega. No. Well, if I add these up, I get these two add up to point O. One five kilogram meter squared. These three add up to point oh one seven. So in this case, it's safe to write these without units because they have the same units and you're dividing them. Probably best to go ahead and write out the units in one step and then. This card of the next. And uh, of course, we have omega before. But we've got a number for that. I should have used that number instead of symbol at this point. Okay, goes down to by by about one part in eight. One part in eight of one point six would be point two, so it's going to go down by about point two, but not quite. I think uh, we got a pretty quick result of one point three two or something like that. Uh, so it hit the proportionalities. I looked at it and said, "Yeah, I'm ninety nine percent sure that's right because that's what I would estimate." Okay. Uh, but never trust my estimates, and you know why. Okay. So, just a typical interaction, one angular momentum with another. Okay. Okay, well, let's say that we have. This, I'd like to use the controller. I should have thought this through before we started. What is this? Okay. Okay. So here, I'll, I'll get away from me. I'll never make it as a defensive back in the NFL. I should have caught that. Oh. I keep looking for tryouts, but they won't give me one. I don't know why. Okay. Probably because I'm too slow and not athletic enough and maybe even too old. Um, okay. So we got this, right? So this thing has its own moment of inertia. You can't just say, well, I'll just assume that all this mass is concentrated at its center. Because you have more moment of inertia in this thing from this half 
can you have from this? Because, yeah, the R's average out. You know, the R's go linearly up here and linearly down here. So if you're just trying to get the moment, you're just trying to balance this thing rather than rotate it, you could assume that the whole mass is at the center. If you're trying to do moment of inertia, you've got an R squared in there, which is not linear. It does average out, okay? So what are you gonna do about that? Well, you're gonna use parallel axis theorem to figure out the moment of inertia of the whole thing. First place, it's an easy integral, but you've also got formulas of moments of inertia. And if there's some kind of strange shape, you might have to use the formulas because you still don't have time to integrate it. You should know how, to. okay? Uh, so there's a formula for the integral of a rectangle, or for the moment of inertia of a rectangle, about a uniformly distributed rectangle about its center. Okay, well, the axis that we're using for the beam is naturally the axis of rotation. That's the axis about which we're calculating the moment of inertia. So we take the moment of inertia of the beam about its axis, which is what we've been doing all along. It's part of the moment of inertia. The beam is rotating. The masses are moving at the velocities they move. It takes the same energy to get them up, whether this thing's on there or not. Get them up to velocity. But, uh, but what are we going to do about this? Well, we're going to say, well, about an axis parallel to this through the center of this, we know this a moment of inertia, okay? So we take the moment of inertia about this, about this par axis parallel to this center. And we add those two moments of inertia. And then we add the moment of inertia of the center of mass. Okay. In other words, this calculation, we do assume that this thing is balanced at this point, that this is your center of mass. And we have a separate moment of inertia due to this mass as it would be calculated if we ignored the nonlinearity of the R squared. Okay. So what happens is the moment of inertia of this thing separately takes account of all the R squares. And the moment of inertia of its mass at this point takes care of the fact that that's where it is, okay? We can't just add the moment of inertia about, of this about the center to the moment of inertia of the beam, because obviously if we move this further from the center, the moment of inertia of the system increases. Whereas the moment of inertia of this thing about its axis, central axis, doesn't about its center of mass, okay? So we get the moment of inertia of this about its center of mass. We add that to the moment of inertia of the beam. And then we add the moment of inertia of this thing about its center of mass. And that's a parallel axis there. It's worth pondering. Not hard to prove. You might play around with that. Uh, but there we have. Well, that's going to be important, I think, for some of the problems you're going to encounter. And you're going to see ample examples. Read the text, look at the examples, look at the problem sets, do the my lab. Okay. Make sure you try to sort that out. Uh, there are two more things I want to do. I want to dispose of the animal but I didn't do a good job of that last time. What I wrote is technically correct. It's not the best way to. But you remember last time we talked about the moment of inertia of, of being about its end. And there are two ways to do it. Since the average distance of the points 
when the axis of rotation is twice as great as if it was rotating about its center, it's going to be four times what you get about the center. And about the center, it's one twelfth ml squared, four times that's one third ml squared. And there's the integral you would actually do. But I didn't choose the most straightforward way of saying this. We're in a little bit of a hurry. I said, okay, I'm going to do it just eyes. Was, what was a good idea? As I figured out about the time I got here. This is more complicated than it needs to be, although it's not difficult if you know how to solve a series. Let's look at it once more. The way this is what we typically look at it by glossing over some of the mathematics. But being a mathematician, can't help but uh, allude to those mathematical relationships. Okay. So we have. Like well, that's a axis of rotation. You understand what all that means? Okay, so we put this on an R axis. Let's actually uh, get the word the R axis record. Here's our axis. Here's R equals zero. And here's R equals L. But setting up an integral reduces to in almost all of these undergraduate physics. You take a typical length. Apply to delta R. So, since I've got all these pretty colors, let's color this in. Let's color this. Kind of looks like an H. No, that's not what it is. Okay, so here's a large picture of the angle. This distance is delta R. And we take a sample point. And then the interval. Position of the sample point. That R equals R star. Now, you should, this should be familiar to you because I think almost every calculus course uses similar notation, those sample points, and so forth. Another thing it does that we're not going to get into here, we formally prove the Bell theorem of calculus. Use upper and lower sums. You do rectangles with upper and lower sums and prove that as your increments approach zero, the difference between the upper and lower sum approaches zero. And the difference between the upper and lower sum is represented by a stack of little rectangles over here that get thinner and thinner, but no higher. And the difference disappears and you squeeze the integral between the upper and lower sum. Okay. So you should know that. And you should be able to apply it because there are cases where you might have to. Probably not, not 
not, not, not that small in terms, okay? Uh, at that point, for the purposes of lower division physics, meaning first couple of years of undergraduate school, which is pretty much all the physics, most engineers that aren't going on to graduate school rely on, okay? Now, there's more physics comes in in the engineering and stuff, but usually it gets glossed over. Uh, we kind of ignore all those finer points and say, okay, let's see, what's the moment of inertia of this thing? We can say that the contribution of the mass in this increment to the total moment of inertia is just m r star squared. Doesn't matter where r star is because delta r is going to shrink down to zero. So when this shrinks down and approaches zero as a limit, that point's got nowhere to go. Okay. Little m is the mass in the center. Okay. Increment has length del r. The whole thing has length l, s, big L. We assume the mass is uniformly distributed. So tell me what's little m? Okay. So we finally got a suggestion that it had the wrong numerator and denominator, but you flip it right. Uh, so I asked a number of questions. People didn't really see this instantly, although they saw a bunch of proportions that are relevant to the different things you can do with this. Okay. The one that's relevant to this is. This is a proportion of this. Then the mass of this, if you have uniform distribution, is in the same proportion to the total mass. Okay. I think maybe during COVID, people didn't do enough proportions or something. Okay. Because usually people come out of the, the preparatory courses able to do pretty good at doing direct proportions. It's a disadvantage if they think every proportion is a direct proportion. Okay, then we got to straighten that up. But anyhow, you got this proportion. In other words, okay, tell the M over that should be big enough. And that could also be it is delta R times big M over L. And 
and that's what we call linear mass density. If you multiply the linear mass density times a length of a piece of this thing, you get its mass. Okay. The whole idea of mass density is fairly obvious. You want to ponder that. Uh, and again, it's something you used in calculus when you're doing moment integrals and mass integrals, center of mass integrals, and stuff like that. Okay. So you want to okay. Well, anyhow, once you get this. You get Sum up a bunch of delta m r squared, your delta m becomes well, uh, delta right up here, and uses this. Delta m is. Keep this still at the sum. And this approaches about equals, it equals the integral. Here, R star just becomes an R because this thing shrinks down to a point. Your delta R is now a dr. It's a differential now. And that's from zero to L because if you partake of this thing in a bunch of study increments, that's what you're summing over. You're summing over all these increments as they get tighter and the number that gets greater and so forth. And the partition runs from R equals zero to R equals big L. Now, in multiverbal calculus, or calculus three, we're going to do a lot with partitions and we're going to formalize this process a lot more. So, you'll have a much better grasp of it by the time we're done with that. Okay. So, it's going to, it's going to help you understand stuff that's coming up in physics and also stuff that we've already done. Anyhow, this interval is. M over L times L cubed over three, which is ML squared over six. Okay. Now, if we want to do a disk. I'm just going to do it briefly. I'm not going to do the details of it. We first partition the integral from zero to r. Okay. And then we draw our disk. And what we've done when we partition the integral from zero to r is we've broken this down into a bunch of small circles, right? So we've got a bunch of rings. Moment of inertia of a ring is just the total mass in the ring, which is now proportional to R. Further we are, the bigger circumference and more the mass, right? So we just throw that into our integral. So we're integrating something else. We're integrating M R to the fourth. Okay. Uh, and it's m over pi r squared, mass over area. 
uh, times the area again. Uh, and you end up integrating MR, excuse me, one half MR squared. Okay. Which is where that comes from. It's fairly simple. There's your image, there's your picture of how you break it down. Should be familiar to you. Okay. Now we're going to change, switch gears, talk about gravitation for a minute. Okay, are we in focus? I said, are we in focus? Okay. The fundamental relationship is this there's a vector form of it that you've already seen. Just multiply this if you want. The Vega slide out in front. Vega slide looks like a blemish from the G. You see, okay. So, uh, Okay. Gravitational attraction for particles of mass big M and little m separated by distance r. And the forces along the line that joins two particles. And it's a force of attraction. Each particle is attracted to the other, which is a good thing because we want to stay on this planet rather than float off or worse be repelled. It'd be convenient if we wanted to get to the moon, but not convenient if we wanted to live. Uh, but we would be alive anyway because all the air would have gone away way before everything else. Okay. Uh, so we just launched spacecraft just hours ago, just 12 hours ago. Well, about 12 hours ago. That, matter of fact, I think it was 1.43 a.m. and it's 1.43 p.m. right now. Two o'clock is connected to signal from Colorado. So, just coincidentally, exactly 12 hours ago, that thing was either fired up and ready to go or just a little ways off the launch pad. Okay, it might have been off the bottom. It goes up pretty quick. It'll, it, it'll get a while pretty quick. So, got a plus or minus there of, I don't know, when I started saying that, we were right halfway. About 143 and a half. Kind of neat. Uh, okay. So, anyhow, okay. There's a PE game. We have to supply the energy to overcome that PE game. Now, this is a function of R for given two masses, and G is your gravitational constant.
Let's do the integral from R naught to R. Left of R dr. Okay. I'll give you a minute to just write down that integral. Tell me what you got. And the camera's out of focus. Let's just now. Well, Why did I do that? Okay. Well, it's very easy to see that becomes G times two gallons. I want to just wear it out here with the That's an easy integral. The integral one over r squared is negative one over r. So that's going to be. I'm skipping steps there, but these are just straightforward Calvin steps. Okay, that's how much work we got to do. Or that's how much work. That's how much work we got to do. Okay. Now the work done by gravity, when we do this, well, gravity is opposing, assuming the big R is less than little, little less than R naught. Okay, gravity is opposing this. So the work by gravity. Is people not just the work to do to overcome it. Okay, well, that switches the signs of these two terms. What we calculated here is actually the change in PE. This is the change in the quantity. I myself from the negative side of the areas. Okay, in other words, if R goes from R naught to big R. This goes from negative GMM over R naught. Okay. To negative GMM over R. Okay. And there's your negative GMM over R. There's your negative GMM over R naught. So there's your change. Okay. Here's more to that. If you are inside a uniform sphere like a planet, 
the planets aren't uniform, they get denser toward the middle because gravity compresses the inner material. But if you use the model, which is what you'll see in the in the open battle problems. Well, if you think a ton, you can't do it with a planet. It's hot, the pressure gets too much, you don't have anything to flatten the walls with. You take a tunnel down to here, and you're standing here. At this point, Gravitational force is G. This, okay, we'll put it back in the law. There's a force. I told you told them that. Negative G times not big M, the mass of a planet, but the mass inside of a sphere that you're standing on the surface of. Okay. In other words, the mass that attracts you is only the mass inside of this sphere. It's an important idea. Okay, you're going to need that. In the early problems, uh, then the other thing, one of the problems is a Dyson sphere, which is really a neat idea. Okay, you probably like it, but I have a little trouble with it. We'll talk about it. Uh, so if they have a planet here, and has it now. A planet acts as a particle on the mass to be considered to be at the center as long as you're outside. So if you're out here at distance, R of an orbit, and you're in a circular orbit, it doesn't look too circular. Triple acceleration is v squared over r, and that's that's four. Okay, what's another expression for your net force? It's big G times big M little m over the square of r orbit. Interesting, because that's how far you are from the center of the mass. Okay. If you're launching a rocket, R naught is the distance that we are from the center of the Earth, right? Standing on the planet, the distance between you and the center is the radius of the planet. In this case, about 6,400, a little less than 6,400 kilometers, around 4,000 miles. Okay, use that R with big G, which is constant, six point. Six seven times ten to the negative eleven newton meter squared per kilogram squared. So the units all work out and give you units of force when you multiply by kilograms times kilograms or meter squared. Okay. Uh, if you put these two together, Let me solve this for B. You can express your velocity. That'll pay off to launch the rocket up to an orbit, say, at 400 kilometers or whatever. R naught is 
or 6,400 kilometers. Ours, 400 more, 6,800 kilometers. So that's an easy calculation per unit of mass. Okay. Although the mass of the rocks keeps changing, and you know that affects how much fuel and how much energy you actually need to get the probe up there because you've got to get the boosters up there, and then you got to get the second stage to another point, and then you get the third stage. Okay. But we really don't have anything with enough energy to get up to a fourth stage. The fourth was a little denser, a little bigger. We don't have got to orbit. We'll be confined. Don't have energy resources to do it. Well, uh, that's why all our, our, our cousins on, on Jupiter can't go on. Okay, here's our velocity. That allows us to calculate the kinetic energy we need. We start with zero kinetic energy. Actually, not because the Earth's rotating. Much of the direction where it's rotation, but most of the kinetic energy we need is going to be due to this velocity. So what happened this way. Okay. So a little bit of an overview. Hopefully that can you know, read the text. Here's the my lab problems, read the examples. It all follows from this relationship. There's more subtle stuff. You see some of it in my lab. Uh, we'll talk about more of it next time. Okay.